One of the things I want to do first, if you're um, military or affiliated with the military, spouse, service member, kid, stand up. Let's give them a, a round of applause for their service. Because this is really what it's all about, and it's because of what they're doing for our country that we get to do what we're doing. And so I, I say thank you to all of you, and, and especially to you. I think you could have been in one of my groups, so <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk with you today about some of the work that we've done. I'm going to start by giving you a bit of an overview of what we know across the board about research with military families, just briefly to give you, to give you the overview. Then I'll go into the work that we've done more specifically. Um, so let's go. The other thing I need to tell you is, in addition to, um, I've, I've not, I'm not in the military. I feel like I need to say that. My family wasn't in the military. I, I just got very interested. Um, back in 1995, I took a, a job that, that got me in touch with youth workers in the military, and it, and it just has evolved from there. So for about the fifth, last 15 years, um, that's the kind of work I've been doing. I've also done clinical work with couples in marriage and family therapy that, at Fort Belvoir that are military families. So I feel like I can offer you a sense of kind of what's the big picture around all of this and maybe get you thinking about how we as communities can be more supportive to these families. All right, so setting the context. Most of you know this, um, but briefly we know that over half of military families are married. Um, 43% of those have children, so we're talking at, at one point about 2 million service members have spent time in Iraq. That translates into almost 2 million kids is the last number that I saw that, that, are, uh, that are experiencing um, the missing of a parent deployment in one sense or another. And you've heard the numbers about multiple deployments. We, we know that service members aren't just going once, they're going multiple times. So if you do the math on that, some, for some kids, deployment is the only thing that they remember about their family life. They don't remember a contiguous time when, when their parents were home because it's home for a while, then deploy, then home, and that becomes their way of life. So I think that's an important thing to remember. The other piece, um, there's this issue of housing has become privatized in the military. Not, we're not even talking about National Guard at this point. So people are more dispersed, and that obviously hits National Guard. People aren't necessarily in the places where they're getting support services, um, meaning access to the, to the PX or access to, um, to resources around counseling or just family support sorts of things. And so that's a very different context than it has been in previous conflicts that we've been in. Obviously, Minnesota is intimately aware with the high utilization of National Guard and Reserve troops. Um, and that's a very different animal as well because this hasn't been the traditional use um, of these service members, nor has it been the expectation of their family or their business. So it, it's a very different sacrifice for those folks, and um, I, I honor that, and I, and I, I hope the rest of the country can do that as well because it's a very different hardship. Um, also, we talked a bit about the availability of support services. Again, it varies by location, and if you happen to be in the National Guard or Reserve, you don't have as ready access to those, to those opportunities. So what do we know from the recent research findings? Um, one of the things I can tell you overall is people have done a lot of reviews lately, but not that much actual empirical research. So I'm going to give you the stuff that we do know. More and more is coming out, and I think that's fabulous. And hopefully these kinds of partnerships will help um, encourage that kind of a relationship. But when it comes to the impact on marriage, the research right now really has some mixed findings. And it really depends on what numbers you look at. So on the one hand, if you look at divorce rates, according to how the military tracks it, it looks pretty st stable. In other words, people aren't divorcing at high rates. On the other hand, if you look at relationship satisfaction, we're seeing a dip. Um, and there's some anecdotal things I can talk to you ab about that. For example, therapeutically, when I see couples um, in, in Virginia, I, I don't know what Minnesota's laws are, but in Virginia, if you have children, it's two years, you have to be separated for two years before you can file for divorce. So what I would hear from some military spouses is, I can wait this out. Right? We're in therapy. They're saying, he's home, he's home for a few months, but he's gone out again. Why am I going to give all this up? You know, I, I can outweigh this. I don't have to worry about losing the benefits, losing the housing, losing all of the opportunities that I have. So, so I think it's sort of a mixed bag. And we've got this, this difference, uh, keeping in mind the difference between marital stability, satisfaction, and actual divorce rates. Um, look at those numbers carefully you know, and, and kind of get the rest of the story. Um, in another study, only about half of spouses of enlisted members felt that they coped well during the recent deployment. Um, Deployment is hard. I mean, that's, you know, that's not rocket science. It's a difficult thing for folks to be separated like that, even if it's for the best of reasons. It's a difficult time. Um, another study of National Guard by Caliber talked about that only about a third, a little over a third, felt like they were well pre prepared for the deployment. 
you know, think about what would it be like to, to get ready for something that you've never experienced as a family before, this kind of, and it's not just he's going away for training, it's he or she's going away with the possibility of never coming back, um, or coming back as a very different person. So we also have to take a look at what's happening for that spouse that's left behind, the non-deployed parent. Um, not surprisingly, in one study that Eric Flake did, uh, about 42% said uh, spouses reported higher levels of parenting stress during spousal deployment. Um, when my husband travels and he's not deployed, it's stressful and it's like a week. So I can't, so I can't imagine what that would be like you know, longer periods of time. So those same spouses, though, that were reporting parenting stress were also more likely to report that their kids were having um, psychosocial problems. So we see, again, systemically that all of this stuff is interrelated. We can't just talk about the kids in isolation, the spouses in isolation, or the community. It's all interconnected. Um, in another study, home caregivers for children of deployed parents said higher, again, higher levels of emotional and behavioral difficulties in children compared to the general population. Um, in the next study, there's actually been a documented increase in child maltreatment rates during deployment and right up to deployment. Part of that's mostly in the form of neglect, which makes sense if you think about it. There's a whole lot of stressors that are happening in that family, and it becomes difficult to focus attention, and so it's been around the neglect arena. Um, finally, we know, not surprisingly, that the child's ability to cope is so completely tightly tied to that at-home parent's ability to cope. So it, it really points to the support network of supporting the parents um, trickles down to supporting the kids. So what do we know about kids? Well, most of the studies to date have been done on younger children, um, and they've been done by parent report or teacher report. So the adolescent stuff I'm going to talk about I think is exciting because that's the first time we've actually asked adolescents who have a voice, you know, what's this like for you? But what do we know about little kids? Well, in one study, children aged three years or older with a deployed parent reported more negative behavior symptoms compared to match groups. This is an important study because in this study, they controlled for maternal depression or the at-home at home parents level of depression. So they, they pulled that out. So this was above and beyond whatever stressor was happening in that family. Um, we also know pretty clearly that parent combat deployment has a cumulative effect on children in that five to 12 year old age range um, that remains even after the deployed parent returns home. It's interesting, Patricia Lester at UCLA is the author of this study. She and I have had some conversations about the, the parental subsystem tends to return to normal a little quicker. In other words, the parents can kind of figure it out, and, and um, not that it's easy, I don't mean that at all, but they can come back to a feeling of safe and security quicker than the kids can. And some of the stuff from our data really points to kids are waiting, or adolescents are waiting for the parent to go back. You know, you said you weren't gonna deploy again, and then you got called back. You said you were gonna retire, and then they pulled you out of retirement. So it's just this idea of you don't have control. So, the, so it's, it's translating into what's happening for young people. So what do we know about teens? Um, one really interesting study at Fort Hood looked at, actually did blood levels of, of teens and compared to teens who had a parent deployed and those that didn't. They did some physiological indicators. And they had um, higher levels, they indicated higher levels of post-traumatic stress type symptoms based on their physiology um, that was different, again, than the general population. So even if it wasn't translating behaviorally, we're still seeing some pretty significant impacts on young people. Um, us and others have talked about this increase of uncertainty and loss, this idea of boundary ambiguity. Who's in the family? Who's not in the family? What happens when the parent comes back to the family? How does that change everything? Um, symptoms of, depre uh, of depression, obviously changes in routines, and much more relationship conflict um, in families where there's a deployed parent. Again, none of this is really surprising if you think about the number of stressors that are happening in a particular family. Um, one, one focus group study talked about that the major source of stress for adolescents seemed to be in that negotiating and renegotiating what are these roles and responsibilities, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, when we compare, th they've also done some studies to compare active duty versus reserve component to see how, how does that differ. Um, youth from active duty component expressed more anxiety around the home caregiver during deployment and more trouble with schoolwork. So this was the parent reporting on the kid, so the parent saying, my kids are having more problems. Um, they also looked at the reserve component, and they found that the reserve component kids tended to get into more trouble with their peers and at school, um, and more difficulty with parent readjustment. The school piece is not, is not um, surprising given even what you talked about, with you may not even know. So, so a lot of adolescents told us, and we'll talk about that more formally, um, I don't tell people that my parents deployed because one, they don't believe me, um, or they just ask me stupid questions and make me think about things I don't really want to think about. Um, or a parent said, don't tell anybody because if people aren't in support of the war, they have strong political views, they might take that out on you. So lots of really good reasons for keeping your mouth shut, 
but that then impacts the kind of support that, that you have the opportunity to get. All right, so we know that there's a relationship between the length of deployment and attachment issues, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, and finally, um, a, a very recent study talked about what were the top things that predicted how well adolescents coped, and it was based on a study that they did and on a review of the literature. But number one, this is in order, included the belief that the deployed soldier or service member is making a difference. It's that meaning, and we'll talk more about that. If, if I feel like my, my family, my parent, is doing something important, that's gonna help me cope better. Um, the next is having a strong family. And third is the belief that America supports the war. And then finally, that non, non, strong, non-deployed spouse. So you see with adolescents, it opens up because there's so many more influences on how they view the world and where they're getting their information that it's not just parent focus, which makes the community very, a very important resource. Okay, so what do we know from our studies? I'm gonna um, be aware of the time and talk about a couple of studies. I, we did two sets of focus group studies that I wanna explain just briefly, and then I'm gonna talk about a third study we did with parents and adolescents together. So the two focus group studies, we did one very early in the deployment phase, 2004, and then we did another follow-up several years later. Um, and we, we worked with kids that were attending different camps. So the first year, we worked closely with the National Military Family Association, and at that time, they had just started these Operation Purple Camps. Do you guys know Operation Purple Camps, some people? So they they graciously invited us into some of the places and we got to talk to kids. The, the second go-round um, was in conjunction with Operation Military Kids, so we had a much higher percentage of Guard and Reserve kids in those populations. But again, we got to go into different states and, and talk to kids about their experience. What I want to say about this data before I get into it is that um, these are kids that were at camp, okay? So have any of you ever got your kid into camp in the summer? Anytime? Yeah? Kind of a lot to do. Right? You've got to get the physical, you've got to kind of be organized, you've got to be on the ball to know about the camp. There's a set of, there's a set of family organization that, that has to kind of be there to begin with. These camps were all free, so, so the monetary piece wasn't there. But what I'm thinking um, pretty strongly is that these kids are probably a higher functioning group of kids to begin with meaning that this data is probably underrepresenting the issues that are going on because, again, these kids are coming from families that were at least organized enough to get them to camp. So, so just kind of keep that in mind. The next the study after that I'm going to talk about um, was more targeted, and I'll get to that one in a second. So I'm combining the, the, um, the data from these two. So I wanted you to think um, ecologically about this, and I think we've talked about that, what's happening in a particular community, um, what are the decisions that policymakers make about supporting or not supporting the war, what does that look like in your particular community? So thinking systemically about this, that was part of how we did our research. The other model that we used, and this is the only model I'm gonna show you, um, so don't worry, no test, um, but is this double ABCX model of adjustment, and it was really developed initially to look at how military families coped back in World War II. So this model has been around for a while. What it essentially does, it says, let's look at what the stressor event is, and for our studies, we, we um, define that as deployment or redeployment, the B factor, what are the resources that that family or that individual have access to? And so for us, we were really interested in what are those formal supports like 4-H, like OMK, like schools, like um, religious communities, all of those types of things. What supports do they have? What informal supports are they accessing? Friends, family, peer groups, that sort of thing. And then we added an attachment, this idea of what's my attachment schema and how does that relate to how I'm functioning over time? The third factor in this model, I think, is really very important, and it's, and it's um, played out in the previous study by Wong. This, what meaning do people make of this experience? What meaning do people make of the sacrifice that their, their family is making? If, I, if my meaning is, this is a noble thing, this is a positive thing, I can cope with a whole lot more than if I say, this is the most horrible, terrible, worst, ridiculous thing I've ever had to be in. That switches how you cope with it. Um, and so we really wanted to see what meaning did people make of this. Because therapeutically, we know that the story you tell yourself about a particular situation really shifts the way that you cope with it. And then finally, we looked at areas of adjustment. So I'm just going to go through some of these, and, and you'll hear the kids' words. And, and I think you could have been on these slides, because it's almost your words, exactly. Um, so this is a little overview of it. I'm happy to share these slides with you. Why, why adolescents? Um, one, just, just a little background. One thing is that um, they're in a different level of brain development. So 
For us, it was important for, to look at adolescents because they could tell us what they thought, but they also aren't able to completely regulate their emotions yet. So, so they're kind of in a different level of what meaning do they make of the situation, how do they interpret that data, and how does it kind of come back out? So this is an important time developmentally. The other, the other piece that's important about this is adolescents are increasingly able to take other people's perspectives. Um, and this third piece of monitoring their own reactions. For example, we would talk to parents and say, how is your young person doing? And they would say, she is great. She's doing well in school. She's absolutely fine. She's really kicked it up. I'm so proud of her. Then I talk to the young lady, and she says, this sucks. I can't concentrate in school. I'm not, I'm not telling my mom because she's really stressed out, and I don't want her to worry anymore because she's got enough worries. So that, that kid can look, present one way, right, to the community and to the family, but be feeling very differently inside. So for us, we felt like it was really important to ask them you know, from a place of, of curiosity, what's going on for them. So let's talk about the stressor event. Briefly, we talked about it as deployment. Um, two, two quotes. Um, the first one talks about this idea of separation versus deployment. So this young, this young lady says, when he came home from like his training, you know, in, in, de, in the deployment cycle, people will go away from training, they may come stateside, they may come back and then, and then be actually um, go over, going overseas. When he came home from like his training or whatever, when he was supposed to leave, but he had been gone for like a month, but it was still like, you know, we were excited to see him or whatever. It almost felt like you didn't like connect again, like he was home, like physically, but he wasn't because you didn't want to get like attached to him again. So like there was a lot of stuff like, oh, this happened, you had so much to tell him, but like it was you didn't want to get so attached again that it was emotional, like an emotional leaving again. And just so you know that this is actual kid data, the qualitative software package that we have to analyze this data, you can look at individual words. And so I wanted to see how many times they said like, yeah, <laughs> right? 1,964 times, <laughs> not kidding. So, so these are real, these are real. But, but you get the idea, this, this idea of he's in the family or she's in the family. I'm, I'm, I usually say him just because in our data it was mostly fathers that was deployed, but not always. But I, I'm just using that for ease. I'm not suggesting that obviously women deploy. Um, but, but that idea of I don't want to attach, I want to connect, but I said goodbye, I don't want to get connected again, that tension. Um, the next one talks about um, retirement. She says, I think he's, he's in the retired reserves, but I think he's going to go back. Like they're going to say, oh yeah, just before you retire, oh yeah, you're going to go back. So again, that I'm always on edge, and that, again, is supported by Patricia Lester's work, that idea of even if he's home, he could go again. So I can never really kind of relax and feel like my life is back to normal. So I'm skipping to the end of the model. This, so what do we know about adjustment? Because it's the B and the C factor in the middle where we can have an impact. Um, so what do we know about adjustment? We looked at mental indicators of mental health, um, conflict in the family, coping, and then just a comparison of high and low adjusters. And again, these are all in the kids' words. So things, symptoms consistent with depression. I can't go to sleep because they are up and doing something and you can't like, you're thinking about what they're doing. The next young person says, the worst time is when the phone rings because you don't know who's calling. They could be calling, telling you that he got shot or something. And then finally, I could tell my mom was getting like really depressed and since she wouldn't talk, I wouldn't talk. And so everyone around the house was just kind of depressed for a little while. So you see how that modeling kind of plays through for the family. Also notice an increase in, um, in conflict in families. Um, so one, one really common reaction was greater intensity in family emotions. Um, and so one, one young person said, I was angry at everybody. The next one said, I felt enraged. Just means he got taken away from me. They took my dad away from me. And then the, the third one said, it's hard not having a dad to depend on for like two years. And now my mom is always upset when we talk about him. Okay. Finally, this idea of conflict, young people came up with this, they, 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 they named it lashing out. They, they would talk about how they could feel that they were holding all this tension in, and then often inappropriately they would lash out people at school or at a teacher, and they recognized that it was inappropriate, but they also recognized that they couldn't hold it in any longer. So they said, sometimes I, like, not because I mean to or anything, but I get snappy, sometimes because the stress just leaps on to other people. Um, also, relationship conflict. Notice changes in relationships, again, an at-home mom. My mom acts different when my dad's gone. It's like she's not her normal self. She's kind of like stressed out, and her stressed out affects me too. The next person says, it's just a lot more stress on her. Like, she holds up her stress pretty well, but she's just like, if me and my sister are acting up, she gets mad a lot easier. And then finally, when my dad was gone, the entire time he was gone, my mom, she just didn't try hard. Okay. This is to give you an idea of what the range of things are. There are obviously kids that coped 
well. I'm not gonna say that deployment is easy for anybody, but there are kids that were kind of on different ends of the spectrum. So I, I wanna make sure that I that you have that as well. It's not gloom and doom for everybody. There's, there's resiliency that happens. But it's also not to downplay the fact that it's not hard. So this is a difficult thing. Um, the reintegration of the returning parent. Well, when my dad left, everything's going one way, and when he comes back, he's starting off right where he left off. So there's just a big clash, and that starts a lot of problems. Like he forgets that he's been gone for like a year, so he thinks we're a lot younger, and while he was gone, we matured a lot over the years, and he's still trying to treat us the way we were treated a year ago. Right? Again, this is important when you're thinking about the context of adolescence because so much developmentally happens during adolescence, you know, unparalleled since infancy. So it's important to recognize that they're not the same person, nor is the parent the same that's coming back. You know, thinking systemically, they've gone through a whole bunch of stuff, and they're, they're not walking back as the same person that they, that they left as. So there's a whole system that has to be recalibrated. So coping strategies. One young person said, I know this is weird to say, but it was like he was dead. So for her, it was easier to think about, he's just gone, I don't want to think about it. I can compartmentalize it, I can put it away. I really don't like show my feelings, I just hide it. Let other people see, hey, if he's not afraid that his dad's going to get hurt because he knows his dad is strong, then why should I be afraid? So that putting up a good front kind of thing. Um, and this, this reminds me of you. Every time they do the webcam, I try not to be around or nothing because I don't really want to see him like that. Yeah? Yeah? The, this young, the, I remember this interview, this young woman said that it, it was that idea of they were Skyping and she could see him and she was really, really close with her dad. And so she said, I would say, how are you? And he would say, I'm fine. And she said, but I was looking at him and I could tell he wasn't fine. So for her, it felt very inauthentic. Um, and rather than being inauthentic, which is really important for adolescents, um, she just, she left. But, but the question then is what message does that send to the dad? And, you know, and then like, I love how you said you felt bad after, you know, you feel guilty because you should want to do this, but it's so hard, you need know, to start to see the push and pull. So to kind of summarize, differences between high and low adapters. Um, those that were on that, we, we, did a, we did a comparison of kids on the ends. So this, this, this summary right here is not high, um, not kids that were kind of in the middle of our of adapt, adaptation. Those that were coping poorly and those were, that seemed to be high adapters. So high adapters tend to show more flexibility in their thinking. They were able to recognize that um, change and adaptation were necessary. Now how did they do that? Well probably they had some help at home, right? That people were able to adjust roles and responsibilities. Um, they were also likely to place their situation in context, like um, at least I'm not homeless or at least you know I know my, my parent is coming home. They were also less likely to internalize their stress and were more productive with it. Um, and they tended to report less interpersonal conflict at home. So it's that old, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy kind of, kind of um, way to go. So making sure that the at-home parent feels very supportive. The low adapters tended to express more emotional responses to deployment, more anger, um, less, less positive meaning, um, made greater expressions of violence and aggression. And they tended to, to talk about more conflict with the at-home parent. They were also much less likely to feel like their friends understood um, what was happening for them. So a couple of quotes. Because I look at how other people are living, like some people, both of their parents died and they're homeless. And I look at my dad and at least I know he's still alive. Um, they talk about trying to help other kids. So some ideas from the, from the high adapters. The low adapters, when my, dad's, my dad is there, we do a lot more stuff than when he's gone. It's kind of hard to adjust things without him when he's gone. Um, a lot of the low adapters the, were younger adolescent boys who talked about losing a friend. You know, I lost somebody that I go play basketball with or I go hunting with or I guess in Minnesota you play hockey. <laughs> so all those kinds of things. All right. So what, what we found in our research is it seems like the, the lynch key in that is the difference is in that what resources do they have and what meaning do they make. So if you're trying to figure out where's the lever, you know, where can I have some influence, we're not going to be able to change the stressor event. We're not necessarily going to be able to shift you know, how, how that's played out, but we can help them with resources and meaning making. So formal and informal supports. Informal supports, again, it's, uh, in, in our study it was things like parents, grandparents, friends. Kids talked about that as being helpful because it diverted their attention, um, because it made them feel like somebody was interested in what was going on with them. Sometimes, though, they also talked about it as being voyeuristic was the word that they used. People would want to know, well, did your dad kill anybody today? Or how many people did he shoot? Or how many people did your mom rescue? Or, you know, that kind of, that kind of talk. And that, that's very uncomfortable for the kids. Um, formal supports included things like schools, youth centers, um, all of those kinds of club sorts of things. Mixed reviews, um, and you'll hear about that in a second. Informal support quotes. From, from young people. I sort of feel like my best friends and their families become part of my family and we treat each other like extended family. And that's fabulous. We need, we need to ex expand that support um, for kids. I've got one friend that will actually talk about it because she has a brother being deployed soon, but all the rest of my friends don't. 
it sort of makes them uncomfortable for me to talk about it, and that makes me uncomfortable too. So you see how they start to monitor? And they go, okay, well, that's taboo. I can't talk about that, so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to fit in. Um, I won't talk to my family about it because they just make it worse. So on the formal support side, this young person said, I feel like my teachers are more understanding and, you know, more apt to give me an extension on my homework because they know about my family. You clearly didn't have this teacher. <laughs> um, because I had this one teacher whose dad was deployed and he died while he was over there. And, you know, she just took me under her wing and was like my counselor throughout the rest of the year. So what, what a lucky child and what a great teacher to, to recognize that this is what was going on and to really be supportive of, of this young person. And this is my favorite guy. He says, I really do not like that stuff, talking about formal supports. I like dealing with it myself. But for other people that do like need the support, I think it would be a lot better if it was someone who actually went through it and is not like their age, but around there somewhat, so they could relate to them more. Because I tried that before, tried to do the one-on-one thing, one -on -one thing, and it was some old dude that pretended he knew how I felt, but I knew he didn't. So it really frustrated me that he thought he could do anything, <laughs> right? It's probably me, you know, <laughs> old dude. So, but but it, it speaks to they want they're looking for authenticity. They're looking for realistic connection. Even if I mean my experience has been even if I don't know anything about it, if I really sincerely want to know, you know, that's the the entree into forming a really good relationship. So now we're going to switch to attachment, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I know you've all had this in your undergraduate careers and across your life. You know all about attachment. So the way that we're using it in this study, this will be your two minute cliff notes semester. Um, we, we know that, that attachment is that idea um, that we're bonded to somebody, and it came about initially um, evolutionarily because as babies, we can't take care of ourselves. We have to have somebody protect us. So the idea is, is that we attach to, to an attachment figure that then protects us, that soothes us when we feel bad, that protects us from the big bad wolf, all of those types of things. What we know that happens as a part of that attachment relationship that forms an infancy gets carried out through your lifetime and it's malleable, but one of the things that happens is that that's how we form those neural patterns or schemas or networks, depending on your, what your flavor of belief about that is, um, that, that makes us think about how people are going to react to us. It's our expectation. We, we as organisms have to have some predictability in our environment, so we figure out ways to make predictions. Our brain is just a prediction-making machine about what's going to work. And so these schemas help us to do that. So if, if the way that I get organized as a child is when I'm scared or upset, mom comes to comfort me or dad comes to comfort me or somebody comes to comfort me, I learn that when I make a noise, I have a voice and somebody responds. I have agency. I, I have impact. And somebody makes me feel better. If I have the opposite experience, where if I cry out and nobody comes and nobody pays attention to me, um, the voice gets silenced. And you'll hear, you'll hear parents say, well, don't spoil your kid, right? Don't spoil that child. Well, see, she stopped crying. Yeah, because nobody ever came. And so, so the message there becomes, I can be in distress, and nobody, there's nobody to rely on but me. And so these are, these are neural pathways that, that get set down at a young age. So what we were interested in is what happens to this attachment when a parent is deployed. Um, because attachments get activated in times of stress. If life's going well, you don't need your attachment figure. But think about when you get really stressed out, you know, who's the first person you call? You know, it might be your spouse, it might be your best friend, it might be your mom, it might be your dad, whoever. But, but there's, we, try to, we try to get somebody activated. Um, so we were interested in how does attachment play out through, through this deployment piece. And we also are interested because we know that under times of stress is when that deployment, or that the attachment relationship um, is changeable. So, so it, it can either be strengthened or there's times for it to, to um, shift in a different direction. Does that make sense, kind of? Yeah? So we were interested in talking to these kids about their perception of attachment, and we were sneaky about that. We talked about, you know, like, when you're really scared, who do you go to for support? Um, when, when you're really excited about something, who's the first person you tell? We didn't say, tell me about your attachment relationship. You know, we didn't. Um, okay, so we're better than that. Okay, so so th this is some of the things that came out consistent with attachment. Um, this young person said, I usually feel a lot closer to my mom because I know that if something like happens, like a snake was in the backyard or something, and it's like more than three foot, I'm not going to be able to take it because it will be able to strike me even from six feet from it. It'll still be able to strike me. And here's the attachment right here. I know my mom will know what to do and how to handle it. Right? That, that's it right there. So the next one, like, my, like with my mom, like I guess she had a, had a mental breakdown completely. So I guess I was more of a mom there, like having dinner and stuff. She just didn't do anything. I didn't talk to her much. I talked to my older brother a lot, though. So this person that she used to go to support withdrew. 
and the last one, my mom was in school, so she really didn't have time for her kids. Like we really like, I can't speak for like my brothers and sisters, but from what they kind of showed, like my mom grew distant from them. Like she'd lock herself in a room at night and like for hours she wouldn't come out and just cry. So, so we're thinking that attachment is one of these things that we need to be looking more at as, as a resource. I know this is small and you can't see it, but we did, we did some quantitative indicators of attachment. We looked at, the, we looked at family climate, how kids reported family climate, um, how, you know, how open, closed, that kind of thing with their family. And then we looked at this extreme levels of low depression and high depression, and we had, an, we had a measure of depression that we used. We also looked at attachment. The IPPA is an indicator of attachment. So on the, on the left side is family climate, and that box, the, the box is the range, kind of where most of the scores fall, and the line in the middle is the, is the median score. So you can see that they're much higher as, as a group. Their, their family climate inventory for those in the low depression group had a much um, warm, open, cohesive family climate. They scored higher on the family climate inventory than did kids in the high depressed group. Not, not surprising, right? But, but this sort of played it out. When we looked at the attachment indicators, we did the same thing. We compared those that had low depression scores with high, and low is on the left. Again, higher attachment scores on the left compared to those that had higher um, depression on the right. So, so there's, some, there's obviously this interaction of family um, and individual behavior, which of course, of course there is, but you know, we have to prove that. <laughs> so, all right, meaning making. So on to this. One of the things that we thought was, was really interesting was how people, um, the meaning that they made out of it and how that was connected to how they were told about the deployment in the first place. So you'll see differences with this. One, one young person said, I found out from, an an from, from our answering machine because a guy from my dad's office had called and my parents had been acting strange, so I just listened to the messages. And I found out and kind of blocked them off for a couple of days. So not a direct line of communication about what's going to happen. Um, compared to this next one, my dad, when he was going to leave for Iraq, he had, told, he had told my mom first, and then one night they decided to tell us, so we had a group meeting. We went to our family room, and they just talked about it. He knew when he was leaving. He told us when he was leaving. Like a couple of days before he left, we threw a party for him, for when he was leaving. It was kind of sad, but then it was actually kind of cool. He left for the first six months to go train in D.C., and like pretty much all over, and when he was in D.C. and then Florida, we drove down there to see him. One time we just stayed for a month while he was training. A very different experience, and not every family could do this. I'm not, you know, not suggesting this is the, because sometimes you don't know, right? Sometimes deployment chance, plans change at the very last minute, and I've had conversations with families saying, well, what am I supposed to say? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but it's this idea of there has to be more of an open discussion, because you don't want to say too soon, because then it might change, and then your kids are just worrying unnecessarily, but it's just complicated. So the last one, yes, but he pretty much just told us and we spent time together, but we kind of kept our distance because we didn't want to like, you know, hold on too much. I mean, like it was kind of like hope for the best, but expect the worst, you know, but we're a really close family. To hear the just complete different views out of the same, the same sentence. So what meaning do they, do they associate with deployment? One young person said, when my dad was deployed, I felt the same as I always do. Once, if you're born into the military, you get used to it. And the second one said, I wouldn't say I felt mad, but it's kind of confusing about why he would want to go and put himself in that position. And then finally, I didn't know anything at first, but I just kind of blew it off. I didn't really know what it was going to be that long. And then when it started happening, started sinking in, it was really hard. So again, you can just see the diversity and meaning that the one young man is like, this is just how it is. We're, you know, we're a military family, this is, this is our life, this is how it goes. Versus why would, my, why would my mom or dad choose that? And that's the perception is they chose this over me. So a big piece of the stress that we've talked about is changes in roles and responsibilities in the family. And some of this can be completely developmentally appropriate and helpful, right? Single parent families have been doing this for years, right? They figured out how to do this. Um, but it's the developmental appropriateness and, and the, um, the clarity with which these roles are renegotiated. So this young person says, um, my brother was too young. He was just about one or about that age. And so my dad really, all he said was, I'm leaving it up to you. You need to take care of them. Take care of your mother and your brother which kind of, I know he had that respect, but I didn't know he would ever drop it on me, which kind of gave me that good but bad feeling, like, yippee, oh, crap. <laughs> right? <laughs> so so we, got, we got really kind of interested in what's the difference between a role that's prescribed, like the dad saying, be the man of the house, I'm going, um, versus the kid thinking they're supposed to walk into that role, and how is that negotiated, and, and how much of a discussion is there about that? 
Um, and the, next, the last one is about reintegration. And it was a lot harder for us to get into the routine of having him than it was for him to leave because there were responsibilities taken up by each of us and then when dad came home, we didn't have that, the responsibilities anymore. But we were used to them and so that caused a change also. And so it's just like, okay, what do we do now? We can't go back to being who we were because we're not that anymore. We have to move forward, but it's also something you have to do as a family. All right, so, so that kind of gives you the overview of um, what's happening with young people. How am I doing time-wise, Jim, am I okay? Oh, good, okay. So I'll slow down a little bit. So the third study, we, we really, based on these, these other two studies we did, we did this in between, but based on our first conversation with kids, we're like, we've got to get in there and talk to the at-home parents. And so in Virginia, we just did this as a pilot study because we were trying to get funding to do it, to do a bigger piece of it. Um, but these are, this is just from that part. And it was only with National Guard and Reserve um, families. And it was, parent, uh, it was a parent and an adolescent or a parent and children. So I'm just going to talk about two of, of the extreme cases here to, to really paint the picture about what happens in those relationships and how attachment plays out in this. Um, so we've talked about attachment as this idea of how you relate to the world, um, when it's at risk during times of high stress, and it's also a resource. So it can be either you know, something you reach for and it's not there, or you can reach for it and get it and it's soothing. It's, it's part of that B factor. So two, two pilots, two, two cases here. The first one, um, not her real name, Maggie. The rest of it is true. Um, Maggie is a Caucasian 31-year-old mother with two children. Her son is five and her daughter was only 18 months old. So she and her husband had been married for eight years. She currently works full-time as a teacher and she was actually a special needs teacher. Um, and at one, time, at, at one time, at the time of the interview, sorry, her husband had completed 14 out of his 15-month deployment to Iraq. So he was almost close to being home. The husband had been with the National Guard for 13 years, but this was his first deployment to an active war zone. Um, he was senior enlisted and the wife had a postgraduate degree. So that's scenario one. Scenario two, Rebecca um, is a Caucasian 34-year-old mother with two daughters, um, and her daughters are older, seven and nine. She and her husband have been married for 13 years, so comparable amount of marriage. She currently works part-time. Um, at the time of the interview, the husband had completed nine of his 15 months of deployment. Um, the husband was on active duty status for six years prior to that and then switched over to reserve status for the past eight years. Um, he was also a senior officer and her wife had a postgraduate degree. Okay, so we were really interested in how does the attachment to the spouse that's deployed shift or does it shift during attachment? And then how does that play out in the resources that, that the spouse has to take care of the kids, right? Because we know that this is a, an interactive model and all this stuff trickles down. So let's look at attachment at different levels. So through the course of the interview, we pulled out just what are, what are different indicators of attachment to their spouse? So Maggie, the, the first woman said, I think I've realized how much I love him and need him and how good we are together you know, how we are a team. And I actually also think I've realized how much he actually cares for me. Because, you know, I'm not one of those wives who calls up and, you know, and, and says, it's great. I'm like, honey, this sucks. <laughs> if it's not okay, I'm not going to pretend like it is. And he listens to me and he supports me. And when he was here, I guess I took it for granted. And now I realize how important he is. So she talked about the deployment as really bringing them closer together and them having better conversations and more just real conversations. And that was really helpful to her. Rebecca, um, again, this is the other extreme, said there would be some nights that the children were, were so constantly crying. If he would call, I'm like, you deal with it. I don't know what to do. I'm, I mean, I don't know what to tell him anymore. I don't know when to tell him you're going to be home. I don't know when to tell him that you're going to be what you're doing. I don't know. And I told him, I said, if this is the way it's going to be for leave, don't come home. I said, I don't want you to come home. So very, very different. Th there's also the background on, on this couple as well. He had... Um, as part of his retiring from the military, made the promise that he was never going to have to deploy. So he got into the guard thinking, you know, these are promises you can't make. But we didn't know that back then. We didn't know that, you know, 10 years ago. Um, so in her mind, you said you weren't going. And now you're going and you're leaving me here with these kids. What, what in the world? Um, so that's so very different levels of attachment. Then we looked at mother's adjustment, some indicators. Um, so Maggie... Maggie talked about it as being very difficult, but she also was able to reflect on it and articulate it pretty well. She says, I call it a cycle. I actually cycle through the emotions where like during the week or for like two or three weeks, I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm upbeat. And then one week it hits me and I realize I'm by myself. This is horrible. Then I get down and you get into the cycle of being upset. She, she talked a lot about her car being the only place she could really cry. So like on the way back and forth from work, she would you know, kind of cry and then pull it together to, to take care of her kids and then kind of go forward. And Rebecca um, said, she, she said, it's like, I can't do, I can't, I can't do it. And then she said, I finally called the doctor and I said, I've got to have some antidepressants. I said, I just can't deal anymore. 
And I'm certainly not suggesting that antidepressants are a bad thing because I think that that's, can be helpful in many, many cases. But for her, it was an indicator of, I just, I cannot deal. I can't do this. So then we switch focus to the mother-child relationship. Um, and so Maggie says, talking about her son, she says, I guess in a way, like the other day, I guess my son was just poking, you know, wanting something and wanting something and wanting something. I kept telling myself, you know, I just need to give it to him. <laughs> I, I, um, I just need to give him a second to calm down or do something. And I thought, wow, I'm doing a really bad job. And I know I have a choice, but I also think in my head, when he, meaning the husband, comes home, it'll get better. And that's all I can do. So, so Maggie, um, again, it's not that it wasn't hard, but she was able in the moment to say, I suck as a parent. You know, I'm really under stress. I don't feel like doing this. But she could pull it together and then try to do some intentional parenting. She was able to reflect on, this is hard, and I need to step up. Um, Rebecca, on the other hand, talking about her youngest daughter, youngest daughter, by the way, um, had, had a suicide attempt um, that, she, that she talked about earlier in the interview. She said she really never expressed that she was concerned. If she did, you know, it would be very rare. There's lots of times when they just close me up, you know, hey, how's your day? I don't want to talk about it. So a lot of distancing in this family between the, the mother and the kids. And then talking about child adjustment, and this is kind of about that role prescription or assignment. Um, Maggie said, I was throwing up in the bathroom, and he came in to check on me. And he fought. he's five, and he said, are you okay, Mommy? And she talked about feeling in that moment like he had taken on this caretaker, man of the house sort of thing. And she said, I just felt horrible about that because that's not his job. Um, and then Rebecca said, we've had a lot of battles lately, a lot of out of the blue. You know, you don't love me. You don't care. You wish you never had us. I mean, it's just been really rude, really disrespectful behavior. See the shift? OK, so what, what, did, what conclusions did we make of this? Obviously, um, there's something to this. I mean, that's the bottom line. That, that the way that that spousal relationship can maintain intact or not stay intact has this trickle-down effect, because it affects the, the resourcing that the at-home parent has. And that then, in turn, affects their ability to, to cope and to parent with their own kids. Um, it's a tight, therapeutically, I can tell you from my work at Fort Belvoir, it's a um, it's a slippery slope because on the one hand, there has to be a level of disconnect for that service member that's deploying um, to stay safe, both physically and emotionally safe. Um, on the other hand, there's this connection that needs to stay on with the family. So, that, so I, I worked with a lot of spouses who had the, their um, husband deployed or wife deployed, um, and they would talk about, well, I feel like he just doesn't get how hard it is for me to be back here. And it's that, well, yeah, and it's hard for him to be there. It's hard for both of you. Um, and with the text messaging and Skyping and email, it's a double-edged sword because now people can be intimately connected a lot, right? Like daily, there can be daily connection and communications, which is good and bad depending on, on what's given. Like Rebecca talked about, um, I told him, here, you, you talk to your kids. I can't deal with them. You talk to them. Well, he's sitting in Iraq. You know, he's sitting, he's sitting there on the phone saying, you know, mind your mother. You know, what is, what is that about? And how does that then impact if he has to go out on patrol later or drive a convoy or something, is he, is he where he needs to be? So, so I don't have an answer, but I, but I can just say that it's very complicating and helping at least couples see that, you know, and have um, a, a, an appreciation of how hard it is to be home and to be the one that's dealing with everything and how hard it is to have to disconnect a little bit and how can we find some space in the middle? Um, because that impacts their relationship, that impacts the at-home parent's ability to parent, and that's where the community comes in. So it's our, how can we help them to, to do this stuff better and to feel more resourced and to feel like they can take a breath? Um, it's a complicated, a complicated scheme. So what does this mean for support? Um, first, helping parents accept what is. Um, and what do I mean by that? It's very zen, isn't it? Um, but, but the idea is that don't, don't candy coat the deployment. Don't lie about the deployment. Don't pretend like it's not going to happen. Um, we had young people who said, my mom acted like we were, my dad was just on vacation. You know, like I couldn't talk to her about it because every time I'd say anything, she would kind of brush it off. Well, that, that shuts down the ability to say for the, for the at-home parent and for the kids, this is tough. You know, and, and we're going to figure this out. But yeah, this kind of sucks. So talking about what is. Helping parents really recognize indicators of adolescent adjustment and looking for those, which is hard to do if you're in your own funk, right? If you're not, if you're not in a great place, you're not going to necessarily be reading other people's cues very well. So helping them to be really aware of what's normal behavior for my child. I mean, you're saying you're, you know, your GPA dropped from a 3.8 to a 3.5, and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> three five. That's great, you know. <laughs> but but for you, that was a big. That was a shift. And so so knowing that as the parent to be able to say that that's not my kid. 
um, that's really important because somebody else might not see that at all. They would see that as you know, not a big deal. So what's normal behavior for adolescents anyway, um, and for my adolescent in particular? Um, the next one is this idea of maintaining consistent expectations, family patterns, rituals, activities. It's not going to be the same, but there has to be a level of predictability. Um, we need that too. Adults need structure in their lives. Adolescents absolutely need it. Um, so it's okay if Friday night now is movie and pizza night and it used to be family dinner night, but there still needs to be some family dinners, some routine that they can count on. Um, they need to know that somebody's there and can maintain what is, even if it's different. And that can be negotiated with the kids, but just some expectation of stability. Um, the next one follows on that, about talking about and making explicit changes in roles and responsibilities. Yes, I know you didn't have to take out the trash and mow the lawn, but now you're going to get to do that, and you get to help the family in this way. That's your job now. I didn't used to be, that's your job. Am I paying you for it? No, that's your job. <laughs> Whatever. So, so making that clear, don't just assume that kids are going to pick it up or they should know, or think that, that you as the parent can do it all, because you can't. It's too much. And it can also be a great learning opportunity for the young people, a way for them to develop competence and display that in service to the family. Um, so also teaching parents uh, strategies for coping with deployment. Therapy is a great thing. Support groups are a great thing. Um, going out to coffee with girlfriends is a great thing. Um, book night, which we is wine night in our community, but book night, <laughs> book club, is, is a nice, you know, just a way to get support um, and, and have some time to just recalibrate because it's a lot of pressure. So getting parents to self-care. Um, Self-care and support and looking for that as well. So what about adolescents? Helping the adolescent prepare for change. Yeah, this is going to be different. Um, we're going to have to pull together as a family. This is going to be a change for us, but we can do this. So talking with them about how that's going to work. Um, talk to adolescents about what's a normative response to having a parent deployed. It's perfectly normal for you to not be able to focus at school. Let's talk about that when it happens. It makes a lot of sense that you're going to worry. Let's talk about that when you're worried, because I'm going to be worried too, but that doesn't mean we can't deal with that. Um, it makes sense that you're going to have trouble sleeping. That's, those are all things that are okay, um, and let them know that it's even okay that we're probably going to fight and bicker a little bit more, and let's nip that in the bud, let's catch that, and you know, kind of remind each other that we need to be gentle, because this is a hard time. Um, but letting them know that they're not crazy, that what they're feeling isn't um, out, of the, out of the ordinary. Um, again, normalizing stress and conflict in the family. It's, it's gonna ha it happens anyway with adolescents, right? So, so just kick it up a notch for this one. Um, also, encourage adolescents to maintain support, supportive friendships um, outside of the family. They need that outlet as much as the at-home parent does as well. They need some place... They need their own book club, right? They need, they need their own away time, their own distraction, their own time just to be a kid. And that's completely fine and should be encouraged. Um, also, be gentle during reintegration. There's more and more literature coming out on that. Um, we sort of think, oh, they're home, everything is fine. And that's really not the case because, as we said, the family has changed, the adolescents have changed, and that service member has had to have changed. Um, whether it's a, a physical difference because there was an injury, um, because of PTSD issues, or even just symptoms of PTSD um, it, that impacts parenting or, or spousal relationship, it's not the same family unit. So there's this period of honeymoon where, yes, things are great, and then, you know, dad's spending a lot of time in the garage playing video games, or, um, you know, mom's not coming out of her room, I don't know what's happening. Be gentle with that. We're seeing that a lot as um, communities try to do programs for people that are reintegrating. They're like, well, nobody's coming. You know, they, they just reintegrated and we did this whole thing and nobody would come. Well, no, they wanted to hang out together for a while, so why don't you let them, you know, let them do that and then, and then be supportive to them. So kind of being responsive to the families, meeting them where they're at. All right, so lots of support resources. I know these slides are going to be up. Operation Military Kids, obviously, we've been talking about that one. Um, great website, great supports on that, great statewide team that you've met. Um, another place to find research and programmatic, programmatic information is the Military Family Research Institute at Purdue. They've sponsored lots of great studies. They're a warehouse um, of all the different studies that are going on. So it's a great place to look at not just kids stuff, but spousal stuff, um, retention things. It's, it's a wonderful site. Another great one is the Academy, um, American Academy of Pediatrics. They have a whole special unit that's just looking at military families, um, and they've done some wonderful work around this. They have videotapes um, that, that you can actually get online that, that are of kids talking about their experience of deployments, whole facilitated um, chats that you can do with young people about their experience having watched the video. Um, the Center for Study of Traumatic Stress is another great resource, again, looking at how integration happens. Military OneSource is, a, um, is actually a free resource to military families, and they have a counseling component. They have a whole bunch of educational stuff all online, and they also have the ability to refer you to a therapist in your community. 
um, for a number of sessions. I think it's up to 12 now, it's, it's shifted. Um, but 12 free of cost. So the therapist isn't affiliated with the military. Um, so there's not that stigma of that might influence, that might get into my um, personnel file or influence my ability to get promoted, that sort of thing. Um, wonderful resource. Zero to three has some lovely stuff about the impact on little kids. Um, they've worked um, also, have you seen that the, there's two Sesame Street videos? There might be three at this point, are there three? Yeah, um, that are fabulous, looking, looking at what's it like deployment, what's it like to lose a parent, um, and what's it like to, to when a parent is injured. Fabulously well done videos, and those are all available on the Military OneSource website. Um, great resources. And then the National Military Family Association, they're the folks that sponsor the Operation Military Kids, and again, they're a wonderful resource for information about families, um, all, all of the sorts of policy issues. So hopefully these are things that you can put in your toolkit and play with a little bit in support of families. And that's what I've got. I want to acknowledge, um, we have a great research team that made this happen. Dr. Jay Mancini um, is now at the University of Georgia, but he and I have done a lot of this work together. Fabulous team of graduate students that we could not have ever done it without. Jim Ford, John Butler, Sarah McElhaney, Kristen Wade, Bradford Wiles, all just a wonderful group of people um, who have increased their um, interest and knowledge of military families. And really, it's been really neat that the way that it works. And funding from Headquarters of Army and DOD Quality of Life Office. So that's all I've got. Thank you.